If you have an idea that you genuinely think is good, something you want to do, something that means something to you, try to do it. Because I think you can only do your best work if you're doing what you want to do and if you're doing it the way you think it should be done. No matter what it is, if you can look at it and say, I did that and I think it's pretty damn good. That's a great feeling. Stan Lee spent every day of his life making the world a more super place. Alongside artist collaborators Steve Ditko and Jack Kirby, as well as his younger brother and frequent co-writer Larry Lieber, among many others, he worked to create a stable of superheroes who redefined how comics are written and still remain among the most iconic characters in modern pop culture. I've already talked at length about how much Spider-Man meant to me as a kid, and between the X-Men, Black Panther, Daredevil, Hulk, Iron Man, Thor, Doctor Strange, and the Fantastic Four, it's impossible to estimate just how many childhoods and adulthoods Lee influenced in his lifetime. And he used that great power responsibly, championing civil rights and social justice as far back as the 1960s, both through comics like the X-Men and Black Panther, and more explicitly through his soapbox column in the back page of the comics. He was a hero. He was one of my heroes. And out of all the great things he did, the thing that impressed me most about him was his drive to create and collaborate. He was a man who simply loved to make stuff. He lent his likeness and voice to dozens of films, TV shows, and video games. He appeared in The Simpsons, Kick-Ass, Mallrats, Video Game High School, even the Teen Titans Go movie. I don't care if it's a DC movie, I love cameos. He never stopped working on his own projects either. He was involved in conceptualizing, telling, and producing new original stories right up to the end. When I envision myself in seven decades, I know I want to be like him and Terry Pratchett, but we'll talk about him another day. Still creating, no matter how old I get. All that said, I'm sure countless other YouTube channels have already had plenty to say about Lee's contributions to film and fiction in general this week. In fact, I know that my friend Scott over at NerdSync is working on his own version of that story, and with his wealth of comic knowledge, I'm sure he'll tell it better than I ever could, so I highly recommend checking that out when he puts it out. In light of that, today I'd like to focus on an aspect of Stan's career that's much less talked about and much more in my wheelhouse, his work on anime and manga. Now, Stan Lee is far from the only Western creator to see their work turned into anime. Many classic novels have been adapted by anime studios over the years, not to mention shows like Powerpuff Girls and Supernatural, and even comics like Witchblade and Radiant this season. And if Lee's contributions to the world of anime began and ended with Madhouse's run of shows and OVAs based on popular Marvel characters, and that one bonkers kids show that turned the Avengers into Pokemon, well, I wouldn't have much to talk about here. But Lee did far more than just sign off on anime based on his work. He clearly believed in anime and manga as powerful avenues for creative expression in their own right. Because over the last decade, he worked on three of his own. He created the concept for last year's The Reflection from Studio Dean, he co-wrote Karakuri Doji Ultimo with Shaman King author Hiroyuki Takei, and he wrote the 2009 manga Hero Man himself, which was later adapted into an anime by Studio Bones. None of these really lit the world on fire, but Stan Lee was in a position where he could make literally any kind of art he wanted to, and he decided to spend some of what little time he had left making manga and anime. So today I want to pay some much due respect to that part of his legacy. Now why would the man at the pinnacle of the American comics movement even want to make a manga? Well, according to an interview with Hiroyuki Takei, his motivation was pretty simple. Stan said that he loved Japanese manga, he'd never done anything with it, and he didn't like to think there was anything that he hadn't done. That interview was published in the first of 12 volumes of Karakuri Doji Ultimo, the long-running Shonen Jump manga that he co-wrote with Takei. And man, what a manga it was, mixing superpowers, mecha battles, and time travel into a bizarre, at times baffling melange of conflicting ideas. The story follows two Karakuri Doji, or mechanical boys, Ultimo and Vice, created by a mysterious and awfully familiar looking scientist named Roger Dunstan as embodiments of pure good and pure evil respectively. Dunstan's goal is to set the two opposing forces against each other in order to see which 
which side of the human spirit, good or evil, is stronger. To fill out the sides, Dunstan also created seven evil doji representing the seven deadly sins of the Bible, and six good doji representing the six perfections of Mahayana Buddhism, giving morality, patience, energy, meditation, and wisdom. Each doji was dropped off somewhere in history and assigned to a human master embodying their respective traits in order to learn more about good and evil from those people. Each master was then reincarnated in 21st century Japan, mostly as high school students, because of course they were, in order to participate in the 100 Machine Funeral, a final climactic battle between good and evil to determine the fate of the world. Now, you'd think that a story about good battling evil for dominance would be as simple and straightforward as it gets, but Karakuri Doji Ultimo is really anything but. Its plot is meandering, confusing, and awkwardly paced, with massive explosions of action interspersed with sometimes overlong long stretches of exposition and character building. It also has a tendency to sort of jump around in time, often without properly explaining the causality behind whatever scene it suddenly thrusts its readers into. So it's a bit of a hard story to follow, and the action scenes can be equally difficult to parse as they involve up to 15 different humanoid robots transforming their limbs into what seem like an infinite array of animal-themed weapons and using god-level superpowers called No that aren't properly explained until, like, the halfway point of the story. There's a lot of time spent shouting out the names of attacks, and very little spent clearly demonstrating what they actually do. And while the artwork is absolutely gorgeous, it's really neat to see Takei's outlandish, delicate character design sensibilities turn toward creating mecha, the line work tends to be a little too intricate, making it harder to read what's going on at a glance. But if you can look past these flaws, the story being told here, messy though it might be, is really interesting. From its black and white, good versus evil starting point, it quickly diverges into gray areas as Ultimo chooses to follow and learn from a noble bandit named Yamato, who uses evil tactics like theft and murder to overthrow the corrupt government that is causing the people of Japan to suffer. It's not a coincidence that Stan Lee inserted himself into this story as Dunstan, because Dunstan's goal using the doji is the same as Stan and Takei's goal in writing this story, to explore and answer a fundamental and surprisingly complicated philosophical question. What are good and evil anyway, and what does it really mean for one to triumph over the other? Is that even possible? Where many examinations of morality like this tend to argue that good and evil are merely relative, Ultimo posits that there's a reason we have words for them in every language, and makes a case that they do, in fact, exist in absolutes. It argues that good and evil sins and perfections are all essential components of the human spirit, and that to grow as a person, it is necessary to know and understand both sides of the world and yourself. Honestly, after one reading, I can't pretend to fully understand the extent of the argument made by Stan Lee and Hiroyuki Takei in Ultimo, and that comes down in equal part to my not having enough time to properly digest it all while working on this retrospective and looking at two other series, and to the manga presenting its ideas and arguments in a confusing fashion that isn't really translated as well as it could be. But I will say that Ultimo presents some interesting and unconventional ideas about morality and embodies those ideas in equally interesting and unconventional plot points and characters. This manga is a wild ride. After a lengthy first chapter set in feudal Japan, the plot of Ultimo jumps forward to present day where Yamato the Bandit has been reincarnated as Yamato the Surly High Schooler, who lives a normal life for like eight pages before he's reacquainted with Ultimo and sees Vice casually slice a city bus in half. From there, the manga introduces a Karakuri Doji who can erase memories en masse to conveniently keep their battles a secret, as well as a foe who can turn into a giant spider and read minds. Luckily, he's saved by the masters of the good doji, but the relief from that is cut short when he finds out that his male best friend Rune has turned evil because he's secretly the reincarnation of his wife from back when he was a bandit, which is uh, a bit confusing for both of them, to say the least. 
Simultaneously, he figures out that Ultimo can control time right on schedule to accidentally destroy the entire fucking planet by creating a time paradox. And that's just the first three volumes. We haven't even gotten into the time travel stuff yet, or the actual 100 Machine Funeral, which is nothing like what the name suggests. Like I said, it's a wild ride. A lot of that craziness comes down to Takei, who did the bulk of the work after co-writing the initial pilot chapter with Lee, but even in that pilot, which is available at the end of Volume 12, you can see that Stan was excited for a chance to play around with the tropes and quirks unique to Japanese media. Between this and his next project, it seems that he was especially keen to tell a story featuring Mecha, and that's oddly fitting, considering that it was the Spider-Man Tokusatsu series and its iconic Mecha Leopardon that popularized the idea of Mecha battles as a key aspect of Japanese superhero shows in the first place. It's funny how these things come full circle, and it's funny how a lot of things in Ultimo come full circle. It is a strange, at times incoherent manga, but it's also remarkably thought-provoking and fun to read. I give it a silver medal rating, though with the slight caveat that if you're not interested in the philosophical stuff that I was talking about, uh, you'll probably be pretty lost with this. And if you're specifically looking for something that feels like a Stan Lee story, well, his next anime and manga project is probably going to be more up your alley. Six months after Ultimo started running, Stan Lee revealed a new manga project to the world. Hero Man, serialized in Square Enix's Shonen Gangan and adapted into an anime one year later by Studio Bones, is perhaps more the kind of work that you'd expect from the father of the American superhero. A straightforward power fantasy about a meek American teen with a strong sense of justice and an alliterative name who gains incredible power in a freak accident and uses it to save the world from evil. That that power takes the form of Hero Man, a transforming super robot born from a robot toy that Joey Jones salvaged from the trash. Hero Man is able to control lightning, punch stuff real hard, and punch stuff with lightning. And it's a good thing he can because Earth is facing imminent invasion from an army of seemingly invincible alien cockroaches known as the Skrug. No relation to the Skrull. And while Hero Man does a lot of the heavy lifting and fighting off these invaders, Joey is an exactly weak himself. The gauntlet that he uses to direct his robot companion also grants him an electrical force field that's impervious to almost all attacks, as well as the ability to move at incredible speeds. And as the series progresses, he goes from supporting Hero Man to fighting alongside him as an equal, and eventually becoming a true hero in his own right. There are certainly parallels that could be drawn between Hero Man and Ultimo, not the least of which being the concept of a teenage boy fighting alongside a robot. But whereas Ultimo is about a strapping young teenage boy fighting alongside a waifish combat robot, Hero Man is about a waifish teenage boy fighting alongside a big, muscly combat robot, so it's totally different. And honestly, comparing the two series does neither any favors. Hero Man has little interest in heady questions of philosophy, I mean, its deepest message is that everyone who loves and supports their friends and family is a hero to somebody. Not exactly Nietzsche, but then it's not exactly meant to be. Hero Man is a morally uncomplicated tale of good triumphing over evil, whose primary goal is to inspire its mostly young viewers with simple, fundamental messages of hope, love, and friendship, and to get them excited to watch some cool fights. It's nothing less, and nothing more for that matter, than the kind of classic superhero story you'd be liable to catch on a Saturday morning cartoon block back in the 90s. And by that metric, it does a fantastic job. Its characters certainly draw from archetypes built in classic superhero stories, and more than a little from Back to the Future if the presentation of the To Be Continued cards didn't give that away. Joey Jones is basically Peter Parker meets Marty McFly, Lena Davis is Gwen Stacy meets Jennifer Parker, Professor Denton is Doc Brown meets every good-natured scientist with a screw loose in any Stan Lee story, and Will Davis is basically Biff Tannen meets Flash Thompson. Meanwhile, the aliens are... Well, they're every evil alien race from every sci-fi B-movie ever. 
hell-bent on destroying Earth and stripping it of its resources because that's just how they do. These guys make the Galra from Voltron look morally nuanced. They're not exactly going to surprise you. And likewise, Hero Man's plot lines are nothing you haven't seen before. You've got the battle for the city with the alien general, the government trying to expose the hero's secret identity as he's on the run, the mad scientist gone berserk, the mysterious trench-coated anti-hero wreaking havoc in the city. You've seen almost all of this before in some way or another, but that's not much of a problem for Hero Man since it executes on all of it so well. The archetypal cast manages to be really likable, and gives the show a bit of a cozy, nostalgic feel, at least for me. And the action scenes that all those generic plot lines exist to set up are nothing short of exhilarating, featuring great effects, kinetic direction, a variety of cool powers, and oodles of Sakuga, though you probably could have guessed that was the case when I said this was a bone show. Also unsurprising in light of that, Hero Man is, generally speaking, a real looker of a show. The art direction is strong, striking a nice balance between Western-style cartoony exaggeration and a more grounded anime look. The designs of the main cast are all very striking, with instantly recognizable silhouettes and colors that just pop, and the backgrounds are a real treat for the eyes. It's not often that anime studios get to play around with America as a setting, and maybe this is my bias as a North American fan talking, but from Kekai Sensen to Beck, I always love it when they do. One of my favorite parts of Space Brothers is seeing the contrast between Muta's hometown and Houston, Texas. And likewise, there's just something about Hero Man's rendition of Los Angeles, sorry, Center City with its warm colors and bright blue skies that's really pleasant to look at. What's more, it feels very authentic to what I've seen of LA County, though its presentation is definitely tinged with American pop culture. And while I can't speak to the show's depiction of DC or Nevada on those grounds because I haven't really been to either of those states, I will say that the background artists did an amazing job of making every place in the show feel lived in. Aesthetically speaking, Hero Man is American as fuck. And sometimes it takes that a bit overboard, like Hero Man himself is basically a walking American flag, and also Lena never takes off her cheerleading uniform, which is pretty silly and probably means that she's stinking up her classroom every day, but that exaggerated Americana can be charming in its own way. Now, you'll notice that I haven't talked too much about Stan Lee's contributions to this anime, and that's because I'm not really sure how far they extend. I mean, he has a cameo in almost every Every episode as a patron of the coffee shop where Joey works, but creatively speaking, from what I've heard, he came up with the plot outline and characters, then left Bones to develop the show while he wrote the manga version. And I'll admit, I didn't have a chance to read that in its entirety. It was either that or Ultimo, and I wanted to cover more of his work. But from what I've seen of Volume 1, it seems to hit the same broad story beats as the show, with differences largely coming down to Lee's writing style. If you've read any of his comics, you know he has a penchant for for kooky supervillain of the week storylines, and that definitely shines through in the first chapter. In episode one of the show, for instance, Joey's first act of heroism is saving Lena and her dad from a car crash, whereas in the manga, he saves them from one of her dad's disgruntled employees who's been possessed by the vengeful spirit of a suit of antique samurai armor. Uh, yeah. It's very Stan Lee. The anime doesn't have nearly as much of that zany supervillain variety, which I do think is a little to its detriment, especially in the heavily drawn out first arc, but it's also a little bit more coherent as a plot, and while it's more restrained, relatively speaking, it's still got alien bugs who attack with killer eyebrows, it nonetheless captures the essential elements of a Stan Lee hero story. It humanizes Joey, spends a lot of time focusing on how he relates to his friends and family, Family, and draws a lot of connections from that to what he's trying to accomplish as a hero. Overall, it feels like a good blend between the simple and fun sensibilities of a kid's superhero cartoon and the tighter plotting of an anime, especially once things pick up after episode 9. And I think it's the kind of show that a lot of American kids and teenagers would have really dug. 
Unfortunately, for various reasons, which were outlined in a great Answer Man article that I'll link in the doobly-doo, Hero Man never got an American broadcast, or a dub for that matter, which means that it never properly reached that target audience, and sadly, Stan never got to voice his cameo. Instead, its only Western release was through Crunchyroll, where it was mostly watched by older anime fans who could appreciate the Sakuga, but I think were otherwise looking for something a bit more nuanced in their seasonal anime. As a result, it's got something of a reputation, or maybe I should say a lack of a reputation, as a middle-of-the-road, forgettable show. And it never made the splash that it could have, and that Bones was clearly anticipating given the blatant sequel tease at the end of the series. But maybe now, with anime hitting the mainstream and shows like My Hero Academia reminding viewers young and old of the appeal that these kind of stories can have, it might have a chance to reach more of the people who'd appreciate it. I'm certainly glad that I gave it a second shot for this video. So while I am giving Hero Man a bronze medal rating next to Ultimo Silver, I'd actually recommend checking out this show over that manga, especially if you're younger or if you've got a kid or sibling who you want to watch anime with, or if you're just looking for easy popcorn fare to fill the Hero Aka void. If you don't go in expecting anything more than a fun time, and you can make it through the slow first arc, it's a really fun time. And I really wish I could say the same for Stan Lee's last anime. If I had to pick a single word to describe The Reflection, the original anime that Stan Lee created in collaboration with Studio Dean back in 2017, it would be dull. And I don't think I really need to explain why, considering that you're looking at the same show I am right now. In contrast to the bright, sunny colors of Hero Man, The Reflection's color palette is drab, muted, and boring. The intent behind those muted colors, in conjunction with the heavily shaded art style, is to evoke the look of a vintage Silver Age comic come to life. Though come to life is a bit of a misnomer when we're talking about an anime that measures its movement in frames per minute rather than frames per second. Yeah, I'm not showing you guys a slideshow here, this is literally what the anime looks like. Flat, stiff characters standing around in front of flat, ugly backgrounds, most of which were clearly created in a minute or two using Photoshop's cutout filter and nothing else. If you're lucky, you might see the occasional lip flap in a dialogue scene, and maybe an awkward run cycle or two, or a few choppy effect animations in a fight scene, and that is literally as close as this show ever gets to Sakuga moments. And somehow, in spite of the reflection being comprised of mostly static images, more often than not, the character art is rough and under-detailed, and the show suffers from a general lack of polish. It's not uncommon for those Photoshop backgrounds to be heavily pixelated or aliased, and there are glaring animation errors in practically every episode. It's just sloppy, and I'm sure there are reasons for that. Outsourcing woes, lack of staff and money. Anime doesn't see this rough a downgrade from its key visuals without there being some kind of production horror story behind that. But whatever the reasons are, they don't change the fact that this broadcast TV show looks like an amateur one-man flash animation project. And a bad one at that. Now, it might seem a little unfair of me to be starting this discussion of the reflection by harping on the show's visuals instead of diving into the better elements and saving my criticism for later, but trust me, the visuals are just about the only thing in this show that I can speak positively of at all, because they at least have a bit of potential. Boring and sloppily executed though it might be, the art style at least stands out, and some of the character designs, especially for the villains, are pure cheesy 70s comic goodness. I really like the living skeleton guy in the reverse diving suit that contains his water powers. The bat dude looks like he could have been a really memorable third stringer Spider-Man villain. The metal ninja lady looks like Rule 63 Shredder, which I didn't know I was into until now. And on the good guy's side, there's this girl with a wheelchair that turns into a delightfully retro giant robot toy, which is pretty much the only well-animated thing in the entire series, and it's made entirely out of anime CGI, uh, so you know what that says. Most of the rest of the heroes and villains at least look okay. And uh, that's about the extent of my compliments. With a more passionate, coordinated animation staff and a bit more color, this show could have been a real treat for the eyes, and its fight scenes could have been exciting and memorable instead of 
hey, did you guys even notice that a fight scene was happening on screen while I was talking until I brought it up? There's cool visual concepts here and really neat superpowers at play, but they're all realized in the most underwhelming way you can imagine. And that's a shame because the reflection could really use some impressive action scenes to liven up its dull paint by numbers plot. Like Hero Man, the reflection treads some well-worn ground in telling its superhero story. Following a massive event called The Reflection, where otherworldly light and smoke flooded the world, people who came into contact with those phenomena developed strange superpowers, with those who touched the light becoming superheroes and those who touched the smoke becoming supervillains. After that, the folks who didn't develop superpowers started getting a little bit, well, a lot bit racist toward the folks who did, so the Reflected were forced into hiding and eventually grouped up with a team of good Reflected aiming to find a way to peacefully coexist with humans, while a bunch of evil Reflected are seeking world domination. If you couldn't guess, the specific ground that the Reflection is retreading is more or less the exact same ground that the X-Men has been covering for the last 60 years. Superpowered individuals standing in for oppressed minorities and fighting over whether violent rebellion or pacifistic cohabitation is the best path to freedom. The show also cribs a few notes from Ultimo, of all things, working in themes about the conflict between light and darkness and the human soul, and while I really wish that I could turn this into a narrative about Stan exploring his ideas through different media, those really just feel like token elements in what is fundamentally just X-Men with a different coat of paint. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. I mean, I just said that I like Hero Man and it's generic down to its name, but Hero Man executes on its generic ideas well while presenting them in at least a slightly unique format. And the reflection does neither of those things. Hero Man is also a show aimed squarely at the young and young at heart, while The Reflection aims to be a thought-provoking, well, reflection on themes of prejudice and morality for a more mature audience. An audience that has undoubtedly seen this all before at least once, and therefore needs to be presented with something new to keep them engaged that never comes. Or at least with some interesting characters for them to latch on to, but that's where the reflection is at its absolute weakest. If you were to take the entire cast and mix them together, you'd barely be able to scrape together enough personality to form one of Hero Man's characters. I Guy, the washed up rock star turned superhero, is pretty much the only character who's given more than a single scene's worth of interesting backstory or development, and he's not even one of the main characters. The show sets up interesting questions about its actual main characters, but the twist in Eleanor's back backstory is, frankly speaking, incredibly stupid and totally meaningless, and the resolutions to Exxon and Metal Ruler's stories lie in a teased second season that, much like the follow-up to Hero Man, is probably never coming, especially not now. And while a second season could have potentially fixed a lot of the reflection's problems, I can't review a show based on potential from something that doesn't exist, now can I? And I could go on. Just about every aspect of this production is deeply flawed in one way or another, but it's not even the offensive, outrageous kind of bad that's fun to make fun of. It's just dull. Where, even with their flaws, Hero Man and Ultimo both felt like engaging ways to spend my time, the reflection couldn't even do that much. The most powerful emotion that it ever managed to wring out of me was mild confusion at its occasional cutaways to a group of random Japanese teenagers. So, I hate to say it, but the reflection gets no medal. It is simply not worth your time, even if you're looking for an ironic hate watch. I wouldn't have even finished it if I didn't feel it was necessary to this retrospective. It's certainly not Stan Lee's best work, and it's questionable how much work he did on it, period. But it still speaks to what was so incredible about Stan Lee as a man. Barely over a year before his death, just months before his wife passed, he was still crafting new stories and worlds, working on a totally original IP with a sizable creative team in a foreign language for a foreign market, all while filming more scenes than many professional actors do, and dealing with his busy main job of being Stan fucking Lee. And by director Hiroshi Nagahama's account last December, they were still working on new ideas for the reflection after the first 
first season ended. Stan Lee was a man with an unquenchable passion for creating stories. In his lifetime, he helped to give birth to icon after icon and helped to define and redefine how we think of superheroes. And yeah, in a lot of later cases, his contributions came down to story outlines and concepts, with other creative minds doing most of the actual production work. It's important to remember that he didn't do all of what he did alone. I don't think that any one man could. And that includes his work in anime and manga. But it's also important to remember that Stan Lee was not a man to rest on his laurels, no matter how high those laurels piled up and how old he got. He used every success to fuel his drive to create and do more. And I think if he'd lived another 95 years, he would still be creating right at the end of it. The world needs more people like that. People who create simply because they love to create, because they think it's fun. People who always try to take on new creative challenges simply because they don't wanna say that they didn't try. That's the kind of person that I wanna be. And to those of you who feel the same way, to those of you who look up to Stan as I do, I think the best way that you can honor his passing is to go out there and make as much as you can and to keep striving to reach new heights along the way. Excelsior! Thank you everybody so much for sticking through this 30 minute long retrospective of Stan Lee's anime career. It was a hard video to work on and it means a lot that you guys actually sat through and watched it. If you'd like to hear more about Stan the Man Lee, you should definitely check out NerdSync's video, link on screen or in the doobly-doo, or if you feel like watching more of me, my Spider-Man review.